thank you everyone for coming. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity to review what we're doing in the Center for Applied for the Arts. Because you, you all know us here, and you might wonder, what the heck are they doing up in that second floor? You know, we do a lot of cancer research. Now, I know many, if not all of you, have uh, been touched by cancer in your family. And we all know that uh, cancer is very hard to treat, very hard to, to diagnose, and certainly very hard to predict or prevent. And so, but we are still striving in our center to go to, to after three types of dreams that we have. The first dream is to be able to predict who is going to get cancer with a new class of biomarkers so that we can tell those people to stop smoking or whatever else they need to do to improve their lifestyle to help, help them have a better chance of escaping cancer. <coughs> Secondly, we want to have a new concept for Preventing cancer, where we give individuals short-term therapy that actually kills the pre-malignant lesions that are lurking in their tissues about to become cancerous at some point. And thirdly, we want to individualize therapy using our proteomic technologies to decide what is the best drug for each patient. And not only to uh, go after drugs that are already in existence, but to discover new drugs, new ways to find Treatment, treatments for cancer that uh, uh, use innovative technologies that we developed in the center. We like to invent things, We're sort of like a James Bond technology park, and <laughs> we like to be rebels, and that's how we're going to do this talk. I'm going to start off by giving you some of what we think we know about cancer, or what others say is true about cancer, and how we think that that's completely wrong, and that launches us into a whole new area of innovation. <coughs> so, you all know that we will never get any grants, any of us, if we don't have a really creative, innovative idea that we submit to the NIH study sections, or the NSF study sections, or the DOD study sections. The review team is not even going to look at it if it's that completely radical idea. Then on top of that, it has to be, uh, have some preliminary data that shows that the idea is even gonna work. And then, even then, they could still laugh at it. But it has to be innovative, and we have to be radical in our thinking, particularly uh, when we have this terrible funding climate. We have to be more creative in this funding climate. And every act of creation is, first of all, an act of destruction. You have to say, well, I don't believe what, what they told me in the past. I want to go in a new direction. If we think about how progress takes place in science, it is not linear. We always see all these diagrams we're showing on the top where so-and-so invented this or thought of this, and that led to the next step, and scientists are plodding along trying to find out the truth, and it gets revealed slowly, step by step. That's not how science progresses. This is how science progresses. We want to be this. We want to be this fish. Science progresses first as creeping boundaries in areas that are in vogue. Everybody is believing in a certain topic. They're all working on it. And at the edges, you're expanding in all directions, creeping along. But then somebody takes an innovative leap. Usually that's because they talk to somebody in a different field and they get a cross-fertilization of an idea like CRISPR from uh, microbiology. So now they, they come up with a whole new topic. Then what happens? Everybody goes into that topic. It's all imitators. And so as young scientists, you should not be those imitators. You should be those people who go set off on a new course. Because otherwise, you're just studying what is already in vogue. By the time you make a contribution, it's too late. Then the next, uh, next new discovery <coughs> takes place. So we want to focus on that innovative leap. And the only way you can do that innovative leap, in addition to cross-fertilization <coughs> of uh, topics from different colleagues who are doing a completely different area of research, that you can say, aha, that, that applies to my topic. What we also have to do is break out of the shackles of the dogmas that we've had in the past. We have to really look at everything that we think we know with skepticism so we can have new uh, approaches to cancer diagnosis and detection. 
new ways to prevent cancer and new ways to do individualized cancer therapy. So our group leaders in our center are pursuing those three major topics and I'll be telling you about what they're gonna do. Now eventually they'll be giving the whole lecture uh, for the entire Science Friday one by one, but I'm gonna give you some sampling of what the members of our center are doing with regard to how we're, in each case, we're overturning the dogma and going in a completely innovative direction. <clears throat> so let's just talk about some of the theories, the cherished theories of cancer that we have to be dispelled at this point in, in our knowledge base. First is, how do, how do genomic mutations drive cancer? We all think that cancer is caused by a genomic mutation that starts and then that cell has an advantage and it grow, outgrows all the other cells, takes over the tumor, and uh, so we want to look for that mutation, use that as a way to treat the patient. But that's not the case, because tumors, we now know, are mixtures of cooperating and competing subpopulations mm -hmm. with hundreds of thousands of different mutations. We put in a grant a couple years ago saying we thought tumors were multiclonal, particularly at the pre-invasive stage, and the reviewer said it's impossible, tumors are clonal, they're all the same clone. They, they rejected the grant. But we now know, and this is a, a paper that just was published in um, um, PNAS, in which they microdissected 300 different parts of the tumor, and they sequenced each one of them, and they found literally a million distinct mutations at different points of that tumor, more than 20 unique clones supporting a continual generation of diversity. Moreover, each patient's tumor is completely unique, exhibiting vast diversity in the genetic mutations and subclones, and mutations thought to be drivers of malignant cancer are already present in pre-invasive lesions. So it's not what we used to think. It's much harder, and you can understand with that tremendous churning diversity in the cancer, why it can outwit any therapy we give it. Another cherished theory that we have to get rid of is that cancer somehow is malignant, it knows that it's trying to kill the host, and the host is just an innocent victim of the malicious cancer that kills by interfering with normal organ function. That's not true. We know that the tumor and the host cooperate, and that that cooperation is really what drives the lethal consequences of cancer. It's a joint effort by the tumor and the host, and the tumor and the host work together. Maybe the host thinks the tumor is a healing wound and takes care of it, we don't know. And cancer is a lethal disease, not because the metastasis interfere with the function of the normal tissue. Cancer is lethal because the host's reaction to the cancer, just like the inflammatory storm that uh, Sergei teaches us about in in infectious disease is really what causes all the symptoms in the patient. That's the same thing in the, in the case. <coughs> in, in, um, same thing with infectious disease and in cancer. Also, the patient may die from the therapy that we give them, not the cancer itself. And sadly, we usually treat cancer when it's too late and metastasis, and it's 60% of the patients already have micrometastasis at the time we diagnose the primary tumor. So with that background of rejecting some of our previous <coughs> cherished assumptions, and we'll talk about more cherished assumptions that we, assumptions that we should uh, reject, let's, we're now gonna talk firstly about a new approach to cancer biomarkers using the nano, nano nanoparticles that we've uh, developed. So we all know that one of the fundamental concepts of biomarker discovery is that if we could catch the tumor before it has metastasized, the pre-metastatic stage, and then treat the patient, it's gonna be much more successful. Because, and we think that's true because whenever we find a patient, oftentimes by chance with a very early stage cancer and treat that patient, they do very well. Whereas if it's a late stage tumor, already metastatic, they do terrible. And so we think if we could really detect early stage cancer, very small lesions, then that would really be the answer to, uh, to treating cancer successfully. And there's been you know, hundreds of papers written on that dream and that assumption. 
However, the conventional method that we're trying to find those biomarkers doesn't work and it's not sensitive enough and it's flawed. And the conventional method is that you take some blood samples from some advanced cancer patients and some blood samples from healthy individuals and you squirt them into a mass spectrometer and you look to see what's different that comes out of those two groups. And then you look to look at the mean levels of your individual candidate markers and you see if those mean levels differ by, let's say, a t-test, you say, aha, there's a mean level higher in this patient, this uh, cancer versus the non-cancer, and so that's my biomarker for cancer. <coughs> Doesn't work, and I'll tell you why. And it hasn't worked for the past 10 to 15 years that Dr. Petricoin and I have been searching for cancer biomarkers in the whole field. Doesn't work. And why? Because of specific physiologic roadblocks and the fact that each patient's tumor is different. So uh, when we look at what we can measure with the mass spec without some type of amplification method, we're only measuring the tip of the iceberg, only the high abundance proteins that that mass spec can see. It's 100 times not sensitive enough to pick up the low abundance markers. Imagine a small early stage cancer lesion elaborating markers diluted in the entire bloodstream. It's gonna be very low concentration. And so those markers are very low in concentration. They're oftentimes fragments made by the degradative enzymes in the interstitial space. They are obscured by abundant resonant blood proteins are rapidly degraded by endogenous and exogenous enzymes, or in the, in the blood tube, and why would we think that there's gonna be one marker that's predictive for cancer when every cancer is different? We would then, instead, we should be looking for panels of markers, groups of markers that uh, are predictive, not just a single marker. In fact, a whole a series of studies just came out in the last couple of years showing that conventional methods for finding cancer markers are not sensitive enough. By a long shot, this, this study was 200-fold increase in sensitivity is required before we can ever detect any early stage cancers. And they said that sensitivity limits for actually calculating how much biomarker, by actual <coughs> calculating how much biomarker a cancer cell produces in kids in circulation has to be in the level of 0.1 nanogram Per mil. Mass spectrometry is the best it can do is 10 nanograms per mil. And so uh, Dr. Bocchini and her team have developed the nanotrap nanoparticles that you, you all know about. And we're very, very fortunate that the other members of, the, of our campus here are using the nanotraps to, for their individual project. And they're making great advances on their own using the nanotraps. The nanotraps are a special type of hydrogel, like in contact lenses, the hydrogel, that have a unique bait, chemical bait, that grabs onto biomarkers, sweeps them out of the surrounding solution, holds onto them, protects them from degradation, and can even pull them off sticky proteins that they might be uh, binding to. They're very uniform in size. Here's an AFM picture of the nanoparticles, so you just simply can dump them into a body fluid, and this special bait that's inside, special kind of dye that's inside inside them covalently will gobble up and capture and preserve the biomarkers that are in solution. And these dyes are simply the same kind of fabric dyes that some, you might be wearing in your clothes right now, but they have an incredible ability to bind molecules with extremely high affinity. Not just molecules, but exosomes and viruses, as, as Kyleen has shown us in the top. And so what we do is we put the nanoparticles. Can I question? Mm -hmm. What gave you the idea of using the, the dyes? Well, we knew that um, um, the nanoparticles, just as an open mesh work, would not really concentrate anything, because it's just thin concentration inside and outside. You might so you're just gonna partition your mixture. No concentration would take place. And um, we knew that dyes were known to bind, like <coughs> histology 
or dyes in comacity blue is used to stain proteins in a gel. We knew that they bound proteins. We thought we need a different kind of affinity matrix, and so we just what we just bought every dye we could get our hands on, right? <laughs> and we tried it out. And so those dyes, and th th a lot of these dyes were never before used for this purpose or studied for their binding affinity. So now we can concentrate everything that's in that entire 5 ml fine into 50 microliters. That simply gives you a hundredfold amplification. We can also exclude what we don't want. So we can clean up the sample. So um, Dr. Lucchini, working with our colleagues in Colombia, wanted to see if we could find biomarkers that predict who's going to get lung cancer from the physician health study. This is a study of male physicians who were sampled, blood, their plasma was sampled over, over serially over time before and then when they got lung cancer. And th the whole point was to see if vitamin C, vitamin E, and um, antioxidants prevented any of them from getting cancer or heart disease, which it didn't, did not. And so they, we have a set of individuals extremely well matched who went on to get cancer for smokers, Non-smokers are former, former smoke, smokers. And using the nanotraps, Dr. Lucchini's team found that there were panels of proteins that they could find that had very interesting biological meaning, perhaps, in the smokers and former smokers, which are very similar. You'd expect that, because if it's a carcinogenesis of <coughs> smoking, you'd, you'd see the same thing. And non-smokers were a different set of markers. And in, the, in a rock curve that predicts sensitivity and specificity, the results were very good with the panel of protein showing in the upper right. And uh, this was validated using an independent blinded cohort. In collaboration with our Italian colleagues, we've also looked at a whole series of different kinds of human cancers from breast to sarcoma, melanoma, prostate, and Claudia Fredellini and Lisa Paris have found a set of biomarkers that are predictive of early stage breast cancer. And some of the markers that they found also show very interesting potential biological meaning. We want to not just have a marker that predicts the existence of cancer or the <coughs> future cancer, but we want something to give us some biological insights into what's going on. And so what we think the new concept should be about cancer biomarkers is not a marker that's necessarily coming from the tumor that the patient already has, but a field effect. A field effect, because if you just cut open a, a cancer of, of the lung, of the colon, you look at, here's your invasive cancer, it's surrounded, same for, true for breast, any, any type of organ, surrounded by whole series of other cancers in various stages of development. Subclones and clones all over the place. So it's a field effect. And if that field effect is generating biomarkers, we can perhaps detect that at the pre-malignant phase before we actually get to the, the invasive cancer. And if we, we have that kind of marker, then we might be able to really have a basis for doing a prevention therapy, but we only can find those kind of markers which are very low in concentration by using a method such as the nanotraps. So that's using our technology and our team's rebellious approach to um, find biomarkers in blood and other body fluids, and when Alessandra talks to this group, she can tell you about how she's using it for infectious diseases and all sorts of different applications. Um, <coughs> So let's now move on to tissue. <laughs> tissue. We would love, according to precision, precision Medicine, or Foundation One, a company that's advertising individualized therapy, we'd love to be able to just take a biopsy of a patient's tumor, grind it up, genomically sequence it, and say, look, there's a mutation in there. I'm going to match that mutation to a drug, and now we can treat the patient. Right? And this is the, the dogma. and. The, Millions and maybe billions of dollars are being spent by companies trying to, to do this right now. But there's fundamental problems with, and, and a reason why the clinical trials are failing. 
that will now tell you and then tell you how our team has gotten around these problems as a completely new approach. The first problem is that when you take out that piece of tissue, it's alive. It's not dead. It's not. It's it's changing. It's struggling to survive in that on, on that cutting board. It, and it's changing because it's changing its RNA, its its proteins, its hypoxic. And so then, when you longer you wait as it sits there, the more the more it's going to change. And whatever measurements you have, they have nothing to do with the tumor in the patient. And so, uh, Claudius Mueller and Jeannie Espina, the lab director, developed a new fixative. I don't know. I know we, we're collaborating with many, vet, uh, many of the scientists here to study this fixative. And this is a one-step fixative which will preserve all these biomarkers, stops these changes, and solves this problem. And in particular, for the first time, it, it preserves and decalcifies bone. Another problem with this theory of just taking a piece of tumor tissue and grinding it up and analyzing it is that the tumor is heterogeneous. It has uh, 10, 20, 50 different types of cells, host and tumor cells in there. Maybe only 20% of it is actually cancer. And you can have connective tissue, inflammatory cells. So you can get false negatives if you grind this up because you'll dilute out your tumor cell signature. Or you'll get false positives because your marker is coming from the inflammatory cells, not from the tumor cells. Or you try to do false normalization. You think you can divide by some marker for the tumor cell, but you don't know what the percentage of that tumor cell is in the entire volume. So we developed technology to get around this problem called laser capture microdissection. This is a way uh, to go in and directly pluck out a group of cells that you're interested in, and then solubilize them and, and analyze, analyze them. And so, and you, and you probably have, many of you have seen this already in our laboratories. So, the, the tissue is alive. You have to solve that problem. Tissue is heterogeneous. You have to solve that problem. But now, when you grind up the tissue and do a genomic sequencing of the tumor you have thousands of mutations. Which ones are the ones that are driving that patient's cancer? Also, in the clinical trials to date, when they have, in this case, it was 130 patients, you know, the, the patients who have individual mutations that you think you might have a drug against, EGF or B2, are just a tiny percentage because every patient has a completely different constellation of mutations. So it's really not realistic to have, wait and hold on to your drug, you'd have to have 100 different drugs that you're, one out of 100 patients could maybe have the mutation that you think is good for your, for your drug. But even then, you don't know if that mutation is really what's driving the cancer. So our founding point of view is that genomics might be the underpinning, but proteomics, the proteins are doing all the work, and looking at the active signaling pathways in the tumor is really gonna tell you what drugs to give the patient, because most of our drugs affect cell signaling, and if you have 100 different genom genomic mutations, the one that's driving that cancer is gonna reveal itself by the protein pathways that it activates. And, and how do we know that the protein is actually in use in a, in a pathway? It's by looking at the phosphorylation state of that protein and how it's in the process of sending signals. So the, the new class of uh, technology that we also invented is called reverse phase protein microarrays. Amy just held a, lab a couple weeks ago the, the International Congress on this technology. Scientists are all over the world are using it. And it allows us to actually map the signaling pathways in a patient's individual tumor. Which pathways are active in use and which are not. And so now we have this suite of technology. We have the nano traps, we have the reverse phase array, we have the laser capture microdissection, we have better fixation chemistries. Now I want to apply this to some example topics. The first is preventing breast cancer by killing pre invasive precursors. Now we all want to do cancer prevention. Imagine that I had a vitamin <coughs> that I could give you today that I thought would block you from having cancer. And, I, and you start taking that vitamin. Okay, imagine, pardon me? A thousand dollars a pill. Well, may, yes, maybe, maybe, but, but how, <laughs> I, how do I know whether that pill works? I have to wait. I have to wait to see 
if that if you're going to get cancer in the future let's say I wait 10 years to see you know whether you get cancer a lot of things can change in 10 years you could be subjected to all sorts of other carcinogenic events in, in 10 years we might, might say in 10 years that was a wrong vitamin to give you it's going to cause all, it's going to cause problems right so this theory that we have of prevention that we want to block the carcinogenic event by some kind of an oral therapy or vaccine is not correct because we, we just we, we're not going to do it in our lifetimes and if some if you got a grant you would have to wait five to ten years to see if your therapy works so instead Dr. Spina has a concept where we would kill the pre-invasive lesions that might exist right now in a patient so they never can become cancer and she's uh, studying this in patients today and it's based on just asking the, the, the question when does invasion the lethal aspect of cancer first begin and what pathways in a pre-invasive lesion is the pre-invasive cells addicted to that we can use as a prevention therapy so let's do a simple case history uh, does anybody know what ductal carcinoma in situ is of the breast? Yes, yes, I see. You usually diagnose that by looking at microcalcifications in a mammogram. Those are because the calcified lesions inside the milk ducts of the woman show you that you have a collection of growing cells. They haven't yet become invasive, but they're filling up the duct and expanding it and crowded in there. Some of those we know are gonna become invasive, invade out, and become malignant cancer. Because all malignant breast cancer starts at this stage. But what do you do with a patient where you've dis discovered these pre-invasive, they're not yet cancer, patient has no symptoms, what do you do? Well, some people think you do a mastectomy, lumpectomy plus radiotherapy, plus hormone therapy, and this could be a 40, 35 year old woman. And others have said maybe you do nothing and just monitor the situation. But Dr. Spina has a different, actually, a new uh, option for those patients, hopefully, which is to give them a short-term drug that could kill these lesions. And um, the team discovered this new approach by just trying to ask, how do these cells inside the duct survive when they're hypoxic? They're stressed, they have, there's no blood vessels or immune cells in the duct, we think. There's no, no way for them to get oxygen or nutrients. They're, the duct is expanding, the cells are dying in the center, yet, yet they're proliferating like crazy. How can they proliferate and still be in, under such high stress situation? So, uh, Ginny decided to just culture DCIS lesions from patients, see if she could grow out cancer cells. Never been done before, and um, it was thought it was impossible. These are not cancer cells. Why are they going to grow? And so she found that she could grow spheroids. They would produce tumors in mice. And she analyzed them at uh, the genetic level. These spheroids could form duct-like structures in culture. And it's been you know, like a revolution in our understanding of the pre-malignant lesion. You look in the animal tumors in the, that the animals make. They're not sarcomas. These are carcinomas. And they stain with epithelial antigen from uh, recognizes human epithelial cells. So we know that the lurking <coughs> in a woman's DCIS lesion are cells that can produce real invasive cancer. And uh, when she studied the pathway that was used by these cells to survive in this high stress environment, it turned out to be autophagy, never before known to be involved in premalignant breast cancer. As a, as a key aspect to keep them alive. And in fact, George Mason, uh, Ginny just got a patent on this entire general concept. So here we see autophagy, which, uh, which is in a process by which the cells eat parts of themselves, autophagy, autophagy, to, in order to survive under stress. And you can see the little, so, uh, these are specific autolysosomes that form around the, the, the contents that they're going to digest, like little tiny stomachs, allow them to digest their own contents, make energy, and survive. And Ginny found that these, these premolecular lesions were addicted to autophagy. They needed it to survive. 
And so in collaboration with Kirsten Edmondson at Inova Hospital, we're running a trial with patients where they, the original DCIS lesion is diagnosed, they get a short-term treatment of a malaria drug, chloroquine, which interferes with autophagy, and then, and then we surgically remove the tumor, and we can see before and after we get to give the treatment whether it's killing the lesion. So instead of waiting five, 10 years, we can see in one month, in theory, whether our, our drug is having an effect. And, which, and in, she has about, Ginny has about a dozen patients in the trial, and for every single one of the patients, or for any, all the patients where there's leftover, any leftover DCIS in the after treatment, we see a tremendously marked reduction in the proliferation of those cells compared to untreated patients or the uh, lesion before treatment. So, so that means we have a potentially new approach to prevention of cancer. Imagine that you could just, a woman could come in and she could, with a high risk lesion, let's say, and we could give her a short term therapy and it would kill all the pre invasive lesions that might be linked, lurking, and not producing any symptoms. Very exciting concept, dream for the future. Let's go on to look at individualized therapy. Again, we're talking now about tissue, monitoring proteomics, looking at signaling pathways in, in cancer tissue. <coughs> Mary Elena, her team is developing and testing in patients an approach for individualized therapy of metastatic breast cancer. Now, metastatic breast cancer is terrible. If a patient has stage four metastatic breast cancer, they, they're not gonna live likely a few years, more than a few years. We don't know what to do with these patients. And so if we had a way to biopsy their lesion and find out which pathways are in use active driving that metastasis, maybe we could improve the therapy. And so that's the trial that Marilyn is in charge of. And in that trial supported by the Side Out Foundation, we biopsy the metastasis of the patient, breast cancer patient, and oftentimes they've been treated many, many previous treatments that have failed. We laser capture, micro dissect the sample, we do both genomic and proteomic profiling, and then a panel of experts selects the therapy. And the way we can tell whether we're making any difference is we're comparing how long the patient lives without progression of the tumor compared to the prior period of treatment that we tried for them. Because you, each patient is different, you have to have, you're comparing them to the past treatment. And in cancer, as you know, every time you try a new treatment, it works not as good as the last treatment, and you end up having shorter and shorter survival time. So we're trying to see if we can extend the life, and when we, um, in the first phase of this completed trial, the criteria for extending the progression-free survival was successful in a highly statistically significant proportion of patients. The blue bar shows how long their life was extended with, without progression of the tumor for these patients. And here, this shows some of the downstream um, pathways that we found activated in the cancer that were drug targets. And the drugs that were predicted by this method, it's a combination of genomics now and proteomics, were not what the physician was gonna give to the patient anyway in any of these patients. So Marilena was able to have a successful trial that's now got into a second level and it's gonna be now a third trial. And she can render a diagnosis uh, in 13 to 20 business days from the biopsy. It takes maybe a month for genomics. Could you go back to, to that? So those numbers are the patients, I assume, 101, 107, 109? Right. Right. And so what are your thoughts about the, you know, let's say patient 107 versus patient 109 where you see a, you know, a, um, a tremendous difference versus not seeing a tremendous Yes, that, that's what's good about this, uh, this trial. Uh, in the end, Marilena has collected all these samples and she, so she can go back and see why we, why we weren't able to have the therapy for that patient. I would say there's two reasons. One is we're not, but Marilena, is she here? Yeah, here. Two reasons, see if I get it right. One, we're not measuring the right pathways because we only have to measure a limited set of pathways that we, we know that targeted drugs exist for that are approved by the FDA. 
So that some other pathway could be driving that cancer. Secondly, even though I'd say many of the times, Marilena finds a pathway that she says, I want to treat the patient with this drug. We can't get that drug. It's not provided under insurance, right? So for those two reasons, we fail with some of these patients, probably. Anything to add? No. Oh. And so uh, then when we combine genomics to proteomics, finally we start to understand what's happening in that patient's tumor. We can see which, if we see proteomic pathway activated, we can go back and see if there is a genomic mutation corresponding to that activated pathway. We can see it, and we can correlate whether the protein pathway goes up or down, and whether the <coughs> genomic mutation would uh, be expected to cause that to happen. So finally, we can put together genomics and proteomics with the same patient's tumor, and we can combine both of these pieces of information and, and have a prediction of what's the best therapy for that patient and give that therapy to the patient. Marilyn has also found that the, when the tumor grows in a different organ, that's a different soil where it has to respond and adapt to a completely different microenvironment, and so it's activated different signaling pathways to survive. Why would we expect the tumor is gonna not be, uh, it would be independent of the soil that it's growing in? And that's exactly what she found. Now let's move on, not to, just to um, therapy, individualized therapy based on drugs that are already known, but how do we discover new drugs? So here's Julie Wolfkohl's group, and she is, is championing the proteomic effort for one of the most cutting edge clinical trials that is, is, uh, exists uh, today. It's an adaptive design trial where a whole series of different agents, new cancer drugs, are randomized and given to patients. Then the patients that do well, we, we record that information for that drug. But the patient, some patients don't do well on the drug and we record that information. So then when the next series of patients come in, they have a better chance of getting the drugs that are working. They're randomized with a higher probability to get the better drugs, the ones that are already working. And that way we adapt, drop, learn, graduate, and replace the agents over time to come out in sort of a selection of the fittest drug uh, to produce a drug that we think is then, then can graduate to actual phase three trials. And one of the drugs that did graduate to phase three trial uh, consideration is neratinib. And they were able to show that in certain subsets of patients by looking at immunohistochemistry scoring and, and standard pathology analysis of whether their patients were HER2 positive or not, they were able to said that this is, neuratinib is probably superior to control and may have a chance of going forward to phase three. So Julie and her team looked at phosphoproteins, the special types of proteins that we're looking at <coughs> in the activated signaling pathways in our protein array. And she found a set of proteins that show activated pathways in the ERB2 pathway, EGF, ERB family, and she found very high significant predictive response rate just based on those proteins. Remember, this is all blinded. They're breaking the code. She doesn't know ahead of time who's gonna do well and not. And uh, this is really exciting because with this single phosphorylation event, she was able to show the prevalence of biomarker positive patients increases by 50%. This increasing the predicted probability of a phase three success by that agent to 90%. Very, very significant. This is proteomic measurement. Genomic analysis did not show any correlations. So here we show the concept of looking at the activated signaling pathways might be a better way to predict whether a new drug can actually be used for patients. Now I'm gonna tell you about just two other approaches we have to find new drugs that are using innovative ways to look at the cancer the first is by Claudius Mueller. He has been championing the idea of swarm intelligence for cancer ever, ever since he came to work with us. Why is the cancer, we know it's multiclonal, we know there's multiple clones in it. Those clones are competing, but they're also cooperating. 
They're helping each other. When one clone is in, in trouble, the other clone can help that, this, that, that clone and keep the tumor as a mass alive. So he's developed uh, um, new, some new approaches to actually kill the cancer cells if they're communicating with each other or to light up the tumor cells that are talking to each other. So eventually he'll be able to look in a tumor and say, who's ones that are doing a lot of uh, communication? Who are the talk talkative ones? And how can I shut those down because they're obviously helping their brothers or their sisters? Very exciting, completely new, new approach to treat cancer. Then our last uh, approach that we're gonna tell you about is using protein painting, a new technology that we've developed to study the contact point regions between proteins as the source of, of new therapies. Most therapies today work by inhibiting an enzyme that act on a catalytic site. But that just scratches the surface of protein-protein interactions, signal transduction in cells. It's all mediated by one protein touching the other in a cascade of events. And so you would like to be able to sequence directly who's touching, where two proteins are touching the, each other, so that we can make a drug that blocks that and separates those two proteins, or substitutes for one of them in a cascade. And so, remember I told you about those dyes that are really bind proteins with high affinity? Well, we can also paint the proteins with those dyes. They coat the entire protein complex, here's what it looks like, in a, uh, on, to scale of the dyes, the paints, on, and the proteins, this is about a 30, uh, kilodalton, 30,000 protein. And we paint the complex of the proteins, all the external surfaces are covered by the dyes, but not where they're touching. So now if we then pull the proteins apart, denature them, the regions where they were touching is not covered up by the dye. And we can now do mass spectrometry, trypsinization of those regions that are free of the dye and, and will yield peptides that come only from where the proteins are touching each other. And so in that way, we can essentially coat protein complexes, dissociate them, squirt them into a mass spectrometer after trypsinization, and the only peptides that come out are where these proteins are touching. We could then use that to make new inhibitors. And I'll give you two examples in the last couple, two, couple slides. So remember I told you before that cancer is not just an uh, independent role, it depends on the host for some of its activities to make it even more insidious. And we know that there's two inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 and IL-33, <coughs> that are involved in an insidious encouragement of the cancer and protection of the cancer against innate immunity. When, a, when the tumor cell releases IL-33, or the damaged tissue that the tumor cell is damaging releases IL-33, that calls in inflammatory cells, which then produce interleukin-1 and more IL-33, which stimulates the tumor cell to make metalloproteinases, stimulates the endothelial and stromal cells to produce degradative enzymes, and, and also suppresses the immune system from recognizing the tumor, because IL-1 and IL-33 originally uh, um, developed in an early stage inflammatory response or a healing wound to prevent the, the innate immunity from rejecting the tissue that's healing. But the, the tumor takes advantage of this. So we would like to be able to inhibit IL-1 and IL-33 at their receptors. And so we use, we use protein painting and using that method we discovered a new specific three-way hotspot between the receptor, the ligand, and the accessory protein that's required for its act activity to send signaling. And in collaboration with Michael Page, we identified a specific interaction of the three proteins in a pocket that allowed us to make an inhibitor. And this inhibitor, we could use that inhibitor to block the three proteins from coming together. You need this accessory yellow protein before you get any signaling. So if we can block that, we get no signaling. So we made an antibody against that region, that novel site, and we made a, um, a synthetic peptide. 
And Michael Page showed us how we could cross-link that peptide and keep it rigid in its, in its shape so it fit right in the pocket of the, uh, of the three-way interaction. And we found that we could now make a peptide that is very potent for blocking signaling downstream from, from cells that are stimulated with IL-1 or IL-33, but not TNF-alpha or other controls or not a random peptide. And we're now using this to, to potentially treat cancer and as exploring its use in arthritis. Because IL-1 and IL-33, we need inhibitors for those, their receptors for arthritis, asthma, psoriasis, and cancer, just to name a few. <coughs> and lastly, we're now using this method to find new inhibitors, smaller molecules for PD-1, PDL-1, which I'm sure you know is a hot topic in cancer immunotherapy. This is a receptor ligand complex the tumor uses to dispel the immune system, to evade the immune system, antibodies to that, thereby encourage the immune cells to think that the tumor cell is an infected or defective cell and attack, attack it with innate immunity. So we've uh, used our protein painting and already discovered some candidate regions that we can use to make completely new inhibitors for PD-1 and PDL-1, and Michael Page is helping us design a strategy in which two loops of the three-dimensional PDL-1 are interacting with, with the receptor. We're gonna make a peptide that spans those two loops sticking out, uh, missing that inner, inner cleft, and have a, a single uh, joint two surface interface regions that are separated in the linear sequence, but adjacent in the 3D structure, and we're gonna test that. And if we have a new way to treat uh, cancer uh, using PDL1 inhibition, it could be very, very uh, useful. So, uh, so that gives you a flavor of what we're doing in our laboratory, and you'll hear more detail from each one of the members of our group that I've, uh, I've shown you their face, now you can recognize them. Sorry I don't have a picture for every single one in our group because there was take up uh, all my slides. But, um, I'll show you the group picture of most, most people. But Ginny Espina said I should end with this because she wants me to know that as a pathologist, I shouldn't get too arrogant. Could <laughs> 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 uh, replace my job. Uh, but indeed, this is a carrier pigeon. We carrier pigeons were the original GPS, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, so maybe they can navigate a map of a cancer tissue, and so they, indeed they were able to diagnose <laughs> breast cancer tissue sections, look at that, Pec I guess it was a cancer, or uh, and, and also radiology as well, so I invite you to read that paper, and then we can get a little bit humble, humble. <laughs> so uh, we're really, uh, anything I talk about is just the work of our you know, outstanding, hardworking team, and we're very thankful for the uh, millions of dollars that we've gotten in grant support from all these different uh, agencies that seem to at least believe some of our fantasies about uh, rebellious ways to treat cancer. Thank you very much.